Okay, well, welcome everyone, and welcome to the very first event for the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, PBBI from Fresno State. Welcome to everyone following us on social media as we are live on Facebook Live right now. And welcome to those here in the webinar, and welcome to those who will be watching us at a later time as the event will be recorded and it will be put forth starting actually tomorrow morning through the the uh, Fresno State PBBI YouTube channel, where many folks watch us at whenever it is convenient. We have an amalgam of events uh, for the fall speaker and conference series uh, from the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University, Fresno. And our very first one tonight, our last one will be on December the 8th. Between now and then, we have over 75 speakers and uh, different panels and presentations. So we hope that you join us. We will have those dates uh, through those of you who are in our uh, uh, special uh, email list uh, and those uh, who follow us through the various social media outlets. I am going to turn this over to our uh, good friend and poet, Logan Duarte, Portuguese language teacher from Massachusetts, who is one of the founding members of the Cagarro Colloquium, a community of writers with ties to the Portuguese world. And uh, Logan will serve as the moderator for this event. I realize uh, that uh, we are having uh, one more uh, writer that will be joining us soon. Um, and so I will turn this over to Logan, thanking first and foremost, all of you for joining us, of course, but thanking a special a big thanks to the writers, to the poets who are joining us, and thanks, of course, to Logan for agreeing to moderate this session. So from now on, uh, Logan Duarte, a poet and also uh, a very good poet, I might add, and uh, a Portuguese language teacher from the uh, Massachusetts. Welcome, Logan. Well, thank you so much, Vinish. It's, it's honestly such an honor to be here. So thank you for asking me to do this. Um, although I'm so happy to be sitting here in the university right now after having our first day of in-person uh, classes, which is, which is very exciting after you know, everything we've been through. It's so nice to still be able to do these Zoom events because it's, it, it's bringing together people from both coasts. I'm over here in the East Coast. We have amazing writers here from the West Coast. Um, so it's just, it's just an honor to do that. So uh, with that being said, I am going to pass it over to these wonderful writers. I am going to just go in the order that I see them and ask them to first present themselves uh, with their name, maybe a little bit about their work and perhaps their connection to the, to the Portuguese American community. So uh, first off we here, we have, uh, I'm seeing Sue, Sue Fogaldlik. Hi, thank you, Logan. Um, ex exciting to talk to somebody in Massachusetts. My grandfather grew up in Gloucester. His family was from Pico. Got something very weird happening on my computer, but we will ignore it as much as possible. Um, I originally came from San Jose. I live on the Oregon coast now. Um, I came from a generation of people who wanted to be all American and um, so I did not learn the Portuguese language at home. We didn't attend Portuguese events. I started doing that when I started um, writing about the Portuguese. I did a book called The Iberian Americans. And um, in researching that, I found there was just nothing out there about the women. And I could see that I, I could see the line between me and my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother who came from Fayal. And, uh, I wanted to write about the women. So I wrote stories Grandma Never Told, which, which is prose. They're both prose books. And I also wrote a novel called Zorian Dreams. But these days I'm focusing mostly on Portuguese. I live on the Oregon coast now and there's not a lot of Portuguese around here. We actually know each other by name because there's so few of us. But uh, I am excited to uh, be part of the group. Um, the Poet Laureate of Washington, I read something that she wrote today it's like she's of Native American descent and everybody expects her to write poems about being Native American. And, you know, as Portuguese Americans, does every poem we write have to be about that? You know? <laughs> or is the fact simply that we are Portuguese American enough? 
Uh, the poems I'm going to read with you today are from a, a manuscript called Scotch Tape and Paper Clips, which is about the, uh, the relationship between my father and I when we were both widowed. My husband died in 2011 and, his, and my mother died in 2002. So we were each other's person for many years. So let me, I'm gonna start with the title poem called Scotch Tape and Paper Clips. Everything he touches is falling down. The face on the plastic living room clock, the broken handle on the toaster, the gate hanging on by a single nail. Paper clips hold the window shades up and green electrical tape binds the wires to the TV and the telephone in the grease specked kitchen where brown tape hides holes in the linoleum. The old man shuffles along, patched with bandages and steel pins, metal plates and plastic stents a pacemaker stitched into his heart. It works if no one moves too fast. Making my way through this manuscript. Um, growing up in the generation I did, my father's not, he's only a little bit Portuguese. He's also Spanish and German and uh, Basque. And he grew up on a ranch in San Jose and my mom grew up in town. And you know, her grandmother didn't speak any English. Her mother and father spoke some, some English and it gets passed down. And so my mother was always the one trying to get us to speak properly. And my father didn't care. And uh, excuse the language, it's how it was at my house. This is called mother and father tongue. I seen, he ain't, asshole. Bullshit, son of a bitch. I'll give you a pomada. Go pee in the casinha. Calate a boca. Siéntese, babão. Polak, ruski, Slovenian, wop, ogi, stupid, dirty Mexican. He's an it. May I, please. He and I, not me. Picture, not pitcher. That's a baseball guy. Ain't is not a word. Chesterfield, Frigidaire. Little Dodge Coop, Crick, not Creek, Cots and Artichokes. You can, but may not. It's lie, not lay. You get a crick in your neck. Enunciate. Speak American. Never correct your father. Incredible. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you get all these different influences. Probably why I don't speak like a person with as much education as I have. <laughs> no, and you know, all of those different influences, that's really what it's about when we when we talk about being Portuguese American, right? We right we're from the United States, you know, we're we're a mixture of, of so many different things. You know, oftentimes, you know, even being when if you identify as Portuguese American, you know, we have so many different cultures around us that are influencing. Uh, who we are, and and that's present in your writing, and that and that's evident. So yeah, right. I'm really a California American, you know. Absolutely, <laughs> I'm Absolutely. A typical California mixture. Right. And they were all working out on the ranches in the olden days. And my my mother's father worked as a foreman in a cannery. They were you know, canning all the stuff that the ranchers were growing. So yes, yeah. yeah, back in the day. This poem was inspired by a poem called Where I'm From, from George Ella Lyon. And I really like it as a prompt because it can send you off in a lot of directions. And this is my version. And this is the longest one I'll read. Where I'm from. I'm from people who say crick and pert near, where adios is just as good as goodbye. And everyone knows what we mean when we say manana. I'm from crack dirt old cherry plum and walnut trees bursting through sod lawns in clay roofed subdivisions, all the driveways full of cars. I'm from melting black top streets, sweat soaked undershirts, blistered feet on sun crisp grass, fishing poles and tackle box, cigar smoke in the air. I'm from homemade lemonade from embroidered tablecloths, well done steaks and portugie beans, warm potato salad and ruffled chips dipped in onion soup and sour cream. I'm from Hershey's in the candy dish, mom's cookies in the jar, vanilla milkshakes, Foster's freeze, brown bags stained with tuna grease, perch or trout on Friday nights, 
I'm from walking to Cypress School, butch cl clutch books clutched against my chest. Girls in woolen pleated skirts squawking like geese in a line, bandages where our Oxfords rubbed. I'm from Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, Bonanza, Edge of Night, Gunsmoke, Rawhide, Wagon Train, Donna Reed and my three sons, Bandstand in the afternoon. I'm from Marbles on the Rug, Jacks on the Concrete Porch, Pressing Pansies on a Page, Collecting stamps from Uruguay, reading the comics and library books. I'm from rosary beads and covered hair, catechism with the nuns, et cum spiritu tuo, communion in a wedding dress, me and all the neighbor kids. I'm from telephones you had to dial, TV shows in black and white, records played with a needle in a box, baseball on the radio, sending letters through the mail. I'm from three cent stamps and penny gum, Two-bit popsicles from the ice cream man from when my quarter allowance added up and grandma's $20 bill stretched from Christmas to the end of school. I'm from little girls who learned to cook and boys who mowed the lawn, from women who wore hats to church and didn't learn to drive or cuss. I'm from ask your father, I don't know. I'm from a world that spun away in a cloud of smog and freeway roar into a screaming hip hop trance, leaving me here with a rusty key that doesn't fit a single door. All right, 72. My father was a storyteller. He died two years ago last week and I still miss him terribly. But he liked to tell tales of day days on the ranch and his time in the war in World War II where he served mostly in Australia and the Philippines. And uh, the man would never stop talking, but he had some wonderful stories. Um, this one's called Shifting Gears, and it's in his voice. My folks were out somewhere when I heard these noises in the yard, a roaring like vroom, vroom, vroom. What the hell, I said and went out. There was my grandpa, my mother's dad, and his brand new Model A. He couldn't get up the little hill from the road into our yard. He'd go up, slide back, up, slide back, over and over again. I could hear him cussing up a storm. His face was beet red. You've got to remember, cars were new to guys like my grandfather, born back in the horse and buggy days. I was maybe 15, but I'd been driving all the trucks on the ranch, trucks and tractors, just about everything. Anyway, I took his place, shifted to low, chugged up that hill nice and easy. What did you do, my grandpa asked. I put it in gear and he stopped me. What gear, he said. He had no idea. He'd been driving everywhere and high. I showed him how to change the gears. Well, I'll be damned, my grandpa said. <laughs> That's wonderful. Really, it really captures the, the generation that he was growing up in. Yeah, I mean, it was so different. I and mean, people were doing horses when he was a little guy, you know, and things really changed. That's true. Changed yeah. quickly, too. Yeah. So much, so much change, which explains why it's hard for him to adjust. But yeah. Um, this one is called 57 Years Ago Today. He sinks into the broken leather chair banished from the living room to the patio. Sweating, shirt unbuttoned, white hairs waving in a blessing of breeze, he pops open a can of bud and gazes at the new mowed lawn. 57 years ago today, how beautiful she looked in her white satin gown, her lips bright red like a movie star's. God, how did I get so lucky, a farmer like me to win Elaine? St. Clair's Church. The family joked that the roof would fall in if Al, her dad, dared to go inside, but it didn't. Old Father McNally, he was an all right guy. Helped me convert, which made her mother glad. She was a good wife, Portuguese, made breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Kept my work clothes washed and pressed, took the kids to church and raised them. Straight A students, grown ups now. Wasn't much of my doing. We never really disagreed, not like the Mallies used to do, good Catholic screaming curses all the neighborhood could hear. No, we had something special. We could read each other's minds. Tonight, we'd be going out, nothing fancy, maybe Mexican. She'd paint her lips bright red, put her shiny earrings on. She'd reach out for my hand. I'd wink and she'd wink back. He swats away a fly, eavesdrops on the new Iranian neighbors. Guy in the house behind him dropped dead in his garage. Heart attack, they said. His wife wanders around like a ghost. He sips. They called us 49ers, married in 1949. 
Pat and Aggie, Rusty and Fran, Addie and Fred, all veterans who survived, married, bought houses, had kids, worked, retired, died. He's 84 years old, alone, whacking at knee-high weeds, planting tomatoes, the labor never ending. Clean the house, wash the clothes, change the sheets, then it's time to eat again. He rubs his leathered face, watches a bumblebee shoot into a hole in an old tree stump like a blimp into its hanger. Overhead, squirrel feet scrabble on the fiberglass roof. Beer gun warm and flat, he leans back, drinks the rest, crushes the can in his gnarled hand. 57 years ago today, son of a bitch. He reaches for his cane, gets up to turn the sprinkler on. Okay, I have one more for y'all. Now, as I said, in the later years, my dad had all kinds of health problems and I was going back and forth all the time from Oregon to California. And when I was with him, it was, we were partners. And people got the wrong ideas sometimes. This is called mistaken identity. People think I'm my father's wife, always coupled as we are, both eating senior meals at the Country Inn on Sunday nights. I have my mother's eyes, her voice, her walk, her way of seeing him as God with grill cream in his hair. Let them think what they will. He's not the partner I would choose. We know the truth that I am not my father's wife, nor he my husband. Both are dust. But once in a while, it feels good to have someone in the other chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing those. So with that, I believe we're going to bring it back to the East Coast a little bit here. The next person that I see uh, on my screen here is Nancy Vieira Couto. Uh, so with that being said, I would be, love it if you could share a little bit with us about your work your connection to maybe the Portuguese community and then uh, whatever poems uh, or work that you would like to share with us tonight. Okay, all right. Um, I, uh, I'm i Nancy Vieira Cudo. I don't pronounce my name the way the Portuguese people pronounce it. I, that's, I say it the way we say it in New Bedford. Um, I'm a poet, I'm a virtual walker, I'm an amateur genealogist. Um, I've published a full-length poetry collection called The Face in the Water and a chapbook called Carlisle and the Common Accident. And of course, I've published in magazines and anthologies, including the two anthologies of Portuguese American writers that I'm sure you're all familiar with and, you know, probably all in. Um, I, um, I was born in New Bedford. Um, my father was born on San Miguel. My mother was born in New Bedford, but her parents were born in San Miguel. So I don't know if that makes me first generation or second generation or one and a half generations. Uh, we lived for the first nine years of my life in New Bedford on Rivet Street. Most of the people who lived on Rivet Street were Portuguese. Uh, my aunts and uncles and cousins, most of them lived within walking distance um, my grandmother was sort of around the corner on Matthew Street. Um, and after a while, the family started moving into the country is what we said, but it was into Dartmouth and there's a lot of country in Dartmouth, but we were in the suburbs, not in the country. Uh, my family lived on a small dead end street. We were the only Portuguese family on the street and I had friends with blonde hair and and I suddenly realized that after living in a um, sort of a community where everybody was Portuguese suddenly I was like different from the others um, but it was a nice place to grow up and I, you know I feel as though like I, I mostly went to school in Dartmouth so I'm from there um, let's see what I can what else I can say um, my um, three of my grandparents died before I was born, and the one that I knew, my maternal grandmother, did not speak English. So there was a lot of um, Portuguese being spoken in my family. I grew up in a bilingual home, and probably my first words were Portuguese. Probably agua was my first. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot most of it, but 
learn some of it. When I was a grad student in the MFA program at Cornell, um, we were able to do other things than just writing. And I did take a first year Portuguese course. And now I can actually read some Portuguese and um, I'm probably my reading knowledge is better than my understanding and my speaking knowledge has totally left me now. Um, so that's my, um, my connection to the Portuguese community. I mean, I'm part of the Portuguese community. Um, I now live in Ithaca, New York. I'm the poetry editor of Epic Magazine. Um, and um, I'm, I live in, in a city that has a lot of people from all over the world. Um, so I'm sure there are Portuguese people in Ithaca, but, and, and once in a while I meet one, but mainly I'm just in an ordinary place with people from all over. Um, I'm going to read, I'm gonna start with a poem that I read uh, quite a while ago. My father always told the story of how he learned how to swim. He, he arrived in the United States when he was um, almost 10 years old, just like three weeks before his 10th birthday. And he told a story of learning how to swim that I always assumed happened in New Bedford. Um, on my first trip to the Azores, which was in 1989, I was staying in a hotel in Punta Delgada, but I wanted to see San Roque where my father was from. And the woman in the hotels told me, no, it's too far to walk. You can't do it, it's four kilometers. But I thought that, you know, that's not all that far. So I walked. And walking, like I was walking along the water, um, and it's now the walk is like they've done it up so that it's really beautiful, but then it was more sort of rough, and there were a lot of rocks in the water, and I'm not talking about the big sun rock, rock but just ordinary rocks, and I was just taking pictures here and there, and when I got back, I showed my father the pictures, and he said, he, he saw one, a picture of a rock, and he said, that's the rock, that's where I learned how to swim. So it was in the Azores, and he, he was, like, he couldn't have been older than nine, and I wrote a poem about it. Uh, the poem is called Grains of Salt. See the skinny boy with the puffed up chest, the one who will grow up to be my father, unless he drowns. The other boys jump and paddle and scrabble up the fissured rock and jump again. Golden boys, they glisten in the sun. Their splashes of laughter and palaver make it look so easy. But my father knows the tides, finds footholds on the rock's submerged flukes and tail and calculates how long he's got before the waves roll in again. He climbs the rock's rear slope and finds a space among the other boys and cracks a joke or two and suns himself and keeps an eye always on the lapping of the water. And when the tide turns, he pulls his shirt on and leaves the way he came when no one's watching. He is nine years old. I know this story. One day an older boy, fooled by my father's bluff and swagger, shoves him in. My father hits the water, flailing, nothing underneath his feet but water. And when he opens his eyes, nothing but blur, underwater soup, and sure a dissolution. He would have said a prayer if he had been a praying boy. Instead, he tries to imitate the moves he's watched the others make, their dog paddles and kicks and crawls, and somehow gets it right. And he's swimming, he's swimming. He liked to tell that story. And he swam often that summer, sneaking off from chores until his mother, who also knew the tides were rising, were ruffling over neighborhoods, over families, over her own children, poised like a flight of steps in the center of her heart's house, caught him sneaking back, pulled him closer, bent, put her tongue to his arm and licked the telltale grains of salt. That was the end of swimming for my father, but not the end of salt. She could taste it on her tongue, in her blood, 
and she knew the tide was turning, but could not have known that soon she would be a widow, that she would board the canopic with her children, one of them still a toddler and another, the boy who would grow up to be my father, a real handful. And after that expanse of salt and water, she would be one of many in a new land whose language she would never master, but whose history she would help to flavor. She would never know that she was the salt of the earth. And now something much more recent. I wrote this poem during the pandemic, but it's not about the pandemic. One of the things I missed most during the pandemic was not being able to go to museums. Uh, one of the last museums that I went to, probably the last museum that I've been to since then, uh, was in the Azores. Um, my husband and I took a trip to the Azores in 2019 and spent most of our time on San Miguel. San Miguel is my island and I'll always like it the best. But I wanted to see Santa Maria. I had seen like three of the other islands on an earlier trip, but Santa Maria interested me because as I said earlier, I'm an amateur genealogist and I know that I had the one ancestor that I can put a name to who came from Santa Maria to San Miguel and I'm sure there were more Santa Maria ancestors. So we spent a few days in Santa Maria, which is a beautiful island. And there was a museum right across the street from our hotel. Um, and I wrote a poem, a, a sort of a crazy poem about the museum and my experience of being on Santa Maria. The poem is called House of Fossils and there's an epigraph. No vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, James Hutton. So I'm moving through the rooms of a museum a Buffy St. Marie song on repeat in my mind's ear, but that was love and this is time, or could they be the same animal or mineral? This house is full of them. We have traveled to a small island, Santa Maria, and the Casa dos Fossages is right across the street from our hotel. Here's where we check out the layer cake of geologic time and hang with trilobites and ammonites and amber with inclusions. Before James Hutton cut his slice, the earth was just old enough to house the Bible's litany of begats. Hutton gave, excuse me, Hutton gave us billions of years we didn't know we had. The history of geography has a soundtrack now. It's eons rapping and rhyming from the Archean to the Cambrian, Silurian, Devonian, Triassic, Jurassic, Pleistocene and Holocene, I've skipped a few. They call our time the Anthropocene and pin the blame on human life for climate change that harms beetles and butterflies. The Centro de Interpretación next door has butterflies choreographed under glass or mounted in specimen drawers. With their delicate wings relaxed and spread, they are a breath of pure spectral color, a fantasy of floating St. Chapelles. If they were alive, who would wish to harm them? In the 60s, Lyndon Johnson wished to harm Buffy St. Marie's career. His people put pressure on the DJs, squeezed her songs off the radio. Buffy always painted the landscapes of her music with a timbre of her voice. Sometimes the picture wasn't pretty, but remember what the poet said about truth and beauty. Back on Rua, Teofila Braga, we squint into the late day sun and think about the beauty we've looked on from Miraduro's halfway to the moon, always ocean below, crashing against rocks or swishing, muck, swishing ruffled islet lace across deserted beaches. It was the off season. As we circled back to sea level, we saw cream colored cows grazing in tilted meadows. We found an open snack bar and sat by a wall of volcanic stone and watched as small 
stone colored lizards pretended to be invisible. Everything was true and even truer now after the dark coolness of the Casa de Sforzage. There is time before dinner for a visit to the public library. I decide to try my luck. The librarians, fluent in English, bring me a book of Santa Maria genealogies, and there he is, my seventh great-grandfather. But I'd seen that book before and wanted more, wanted the skeleton key to a life. You can't always get what you want, as the poet said. At least I have his name spiraled tight as an ammonite in the palm of my mind, with all the music, all the poems, a ticket to ride the slow continuum. Tonight, we'll toast with a full-bodied wine. Uh, I'd love to write, read one more if there's time. And I've got it somewhere here on my computer, if I can find it. Oh, come on, where are you? Or not. Okay, I'm gonna do it the old fashioned way and I'm gonna read it on a piece of paper. It's somewhere on my computer, but I sort of wasn't sure they would have time. The poem is called 30. And it's 30 with a hyphen before and a hyphen after. And Sue knows what it is because she was a journalist. Um, maybe still as a journalist, um, but that's how in the old days of linotype machines, reporters would end their, their copy and they'd just put 30 at the bottom and it just means the end. So I didn't want to call it the poem the end, but the poem is called 30. It's a golden, it's a golden shovel, a golden shovel full of fire and ice after Robert Frost. Shelter is the story we are some weeks into. Pandemi pandemiologists say social distancing is how we'll squash the curve, how we'll save the world as we know it. And we will save our real world, which will not end in DIY haircuts or in blanked out refrigerators or balls of fire. But will we know it? Will the saved some of us shrug back into our lives, like say putting on a jacket, walking into the watershed for cocktails over ice and conversation? I mean, for real, not from rectangles on a screen, although what would we do without them? I've dressed for virtual gatherings, tasted cheddar on real writs, which makes me think of Marianne Moore, who taught me to desire dexterous paws and teeth in all that I imagine. Right now, I need to hold tight to that image, masks, tails with rings around them. See them circling those imagined gardens like true actors who improvise, experiment, and favor facts and statistics over fire and promises. So sheltering but hungry, I can't help but wonder if the wash bear is showing how to do it, how to survive. Already we have had some success, no new cases today. Nobody wants to perish. So we wash our hands, sing happy birthday twice and tighten our masks. As for the end, I don't know what will kill us, but I think we're in for a surprise. I guess what I mean is that by now we ought to know how to go on, how to stash enough mega rolls of chairman for the stretch of the emergency and how to hate our tiny enemy because we need to have an enemy. What I mean to say, what I am saying badly is that enemies of all aspects are lined up for us to finger. All I know of destruction is what's written in our history of ice and fire. The wash bear waddles. She is skilled at knocking lids off trash cans. Also slinking through the sewers of the great metropolis. And I, I juggle earth and air and hope for balance. Balance would suffice. Well, thanks for listening. This, this poem was written earlier in the pandemic when we really were having only 
one new case or no new cases today. And now all of that is, is over and we're seeing a lot of cases again. So maybe I should rewrite it and call it 31 or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening. Thank you so much for sharing. It's, it's, a, it's a wild ride for sure. There's a lot to resonate with there. Uh, and you, you communicate it so well with such a wonderful poetic voice and, and strong imagery. Uh, so, so thank you again. Thank you. Uh, with that being said, I will continue here on to Anne-Marie Ross. Would you mind sharing a bit about your work, your connection to the Portuguese American community, and uh, any work you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, um, I am half Portuguese. My mom is from Lisbon, but we have kind of a really complicated identity. Um, her father was actually the last generation to live in kind of like this colonial life really and then when he was nine years old his father died and they went back to Lisbon and they kind of hid everything but he also you know he spoke English at home when he was a child because he had an English Irish grandmother and it was it was very different than very different than most of the people my mom was around when she grew up in Waitas. So she came when she was 18. And I mean, when I was very little, I spoke Portuguese pretty well. And I could run circles around myself at two. I, you know, <laughs> um, my, my skills now are so much worse than they were when I was a toddler. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I've, now I have a toddler and I'm trying to teach him something even because, you know, I really believe a little um, a scrunched up cupcake is better than no dessert, but, you know, <laughs> it's kind of been hard to teach him when I, I mean, basically he understands stock phrases. <laughs> That's it. So I'm trying to pass things down, but it's, it's very difficult because I don't have to the fluency, but anyway, um, most of my work is about our connection to Cape Baird and of course by, the, by extension to Portugal because even though my grandfather was born, I mean, technically it was abroad, at the time it was just another province and he did not consider himself not to be Portuguese. Um, he didn't go to the little uh, he didn't go to the consulate and get his passport in time when the colony pulled away. He was already in America. And we went, wanted to go back to Portugal in 1990 and see relatives. And he had to get a Cape Verde passport and he was not okay with that. <laughs> but there was nothing we could do. I mean, the, the cutoff was in like 1981 or something. That was it. So, um, I don't know. I look at my grandfather as kind of like, his university was kind of a mirror to mine. And, you know, his reality is kind of a mirror to things that are part of my life, even though that life is gone. Um, so I write a lot about imperialism and about what, what do we do now? I mean, there's still parts of me that are very much come from that society from you know the 1800s in Cape Girard when it was just it was a pretty brutal place and um all of our identities are way more complicated than just you know Portuguese um like I have a cousin who she said I mean we're part of the there's about four four thousand give or take like white Cape Girardians that went back to Portugal and they're part of you know, Portuguese society, but um, there's just, there's not very many of us, but my cousin at the same time, she says, well, there's no such thing as white Cape Verdean, and except for me, because my parents are cousins, so it's kind of like, I don't know, um, like Appalachia with better dishes or something, but um, anyway, so I wrote, I wrote this essay for, I participated in Just White Twice, and that's a literary um, seminar in Portugal. Um, and once as a student, and then once as a, a reader, because I was in this anthology. So I'm gonna read part of my essay for the anthology. 
Um, it's, it's about a roommate I had in college and she's from Barbados and my family's from Portugal and Cape Verde. And there's actually kind of some parallels between the two places and between how um, we, well, for one, you know, Jamaica kind of overtakes the popularity and the attention away from Barbados. Nobody, not nobody, but the countries around Portugal are more famous and take away from people don't know quite what to make of Portugal. It's kind of that, but there's also the the legacy of slavery very similar. So it's about that. And I guess I'll just start reading. Um, so I had no idea human flesh could ever get that white or that hairy, Angela laughed. It's a Saturday morning in January where even in San Diego, I had been wearing jeans for weeks. She is on her creaky bed in the third college apartment, and I am dancing in my flannel nightgown in the middle of our swirling mess of paper. It was an exceptionally lucky roommate draw. Anyone else would find the mess unlivable. I stop. I look down at my dangling legs. She's right. Darn Irish grandparents, I yell. You, you have Irish grandparents? Well, not your lucky. Anne Marie, how does not one not have direct grandparents? Well, and aren't you Portuguese? I sighed. It was more complicated than that. Every year, my grandfather, the nervous Fernando, had gotten out his quarterly clover pin on St. Patrick's Day because his grandmother was Irish. This moment, though, was a point of pride for my grandfather, even though he spent most of his adult life within walking distance of his beloved terraces of the Giza. Grandmama ended up in Africa, but she was Irish. Africa. She gives this intense look in her eyes if something doesn't really add up. She keeps going until it does. Africa, really? Yes. Yeah. Whatever was she doing in Africa? Well, I don't know, working as a governess in Cape Verde. In Africa, yes. Yeah. Just got up and moved to Africa. I don't know, doesn't everybody want an English nanny like Mary Poppins? Mary Poppins isn't Irish. Well, yeah, but they found Grandmama with a newspaper ad in England, so I guess she was both. Both, huh? That's odd. Most Irish people don't go around calling themselves English nannies and then run off to jobs in Africa. Well, this one did. Angela looks at me quizzically. I keep talking anyway. She ended up marrying the guy whose kids she was tutoring anyway, and everybody's took English at home. In Africa. Yes. Portuguese, Africa. Well, it was kind of unusual. And she married her boss? Well, wouldn't you? Did his wife mind? She asked, raising her eyebrows and smiling a little. I don't know, Angela. I'm sure she had the decency to be dead first. You're only sure. Nope, sorry. There's no cool Jane Eyre surprise. And this was in Africa. Cape Verde is a chain of islands off of Africa. Yes, they lived off the islands, off the coast for hundreds of years with their boats. You know what that means, don't you, Anne-Marie? My grandfather should have gone to boarding school. I bristle. That was not the answer. Boats? I had to go say something like boats? Why didn't I just say something a little less loaded, like coffee plantation or slave quarters? This had not come up after a whole quarter together, and bam, one of us is going to say it out loud. It's going to come shooting out like a water from a broken pipe all over our peaceful little cluttered bedroom. I had heard the story. My grandfather's grandfather, it had been told, had oh so generously let one of his slaves, or had let every one of his slaves go just randomly on a Tuesday or whatever. Because it dawned on him that, oh my God, you aren't supposed to own people. I don't believe that story either. And it's just a little disingenuous to call it freeing people when you're the one rich guy in town on an island that's basically a massive volcano. But if we don't say it out loud, the world stays in the past, right? It can't come in here and flail its arms around in our space while we study and read and write and try to learn to cook breakfast. It cannot watch us when we share secret cups of vodka before silly magic rituals to make us dream about the man you'll one day sleep with because we're both gravely behind in that quest. Please, 
please let it not come out in the open and erase any of the joy we have in this apartment. Oh my God, this is why my mom insists we should not repeat the stories in public. You end up flaunting your family's dirty laundry in front of your new roommate, who is also the president of the Black Student Union and a history major whose big quote is fam she's famous for is, I have to have my facts. Um, no, I'm just not surprised because your brother is straight up black sometimes, but you, Anne, she turns straight to look, look at me, look right through me. You don't have any of that in you. What the hell is she talking about? Yeah, my brother is a tiny bit less Englishy looking, and he certainly doesn't look black. He looks like a more believable Portuguese, maybe, except that he's 17 feet tall and has the feet the size of snowshoes, but she's sort of blonde. You know, Anne, I met relatives in England who are as white as you because my mother's a cumberbatch, she reminds me. I nodded, but I thought it was a cross. But how was I going to win an argument about who showed up pale and pasty in her own family? Then how are you surprised by my white hairy glow, she, I say, hoping she would laugh. Um, I have never seen their winter legs, and now I am grateful for the distance between us. It's not so bad. My only problem is that it's freaking 72 in December, so at least I have to cut the trees so I can ventilate the front. But you probably have the same, she continues, ignoring my joke. The same what? Legs? African relatives. I think all the white people left already. I mean, they sort of had to. No, Anne, I mean, black ones. I froze. It sounded crazy, but not really debatable at the same time. I guess somebody could have passed and married into the family, but they were really picky. Nobody's picky all the time, she said, leaning back on her creaky bed, sinking into her studying once more. I was afraid to tell her that it really couldn't be. It was just that my island wasn't like that. How could hers be any different? It wasn't right, and it wasn't fair, and it wasn't how we were supposed to live, but in those places, the whites are the whites, the blacks are the blacks, and there just aren't any gray lines or pleasantly golden brown ones ever. So it's not to say there weren't any black relatives. There were untold troops of cousins, and it wasn't unheard of for men to have a few extra children pop up in their wills. And if you knew your illegitimate kid and protected them and acknowledged, acknowledged them, could they join the ranch for the privilege? Sure. But not to the bloodline that mattered, and we were the captains and the poets and the painters and the merchants. Our bloodline mattered. And the doctors just got crap, sorry. But oh my God, I could never say that to someone out loud outside my family. And I wasn't sure if Angela would like me either if I did not say what Americans are supposed to say and talk the way we did behind closed doors, pointing out things I see in faces and in bodies. These are things I don't know how I see but I bat him away like a cat toy into oblivion behind the couch. So I nodded, sure, Angela, whatever you say, Angela, I'll say anything not to have read stories in our faces. And as I have learned since she passed away 10 years ago, that woman was always totally, absolutely dead on right. Okay. Excellent. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Yes. So it brings us to our last, but certainly not least uh, presenter here that we have today, uh, Diana Hamush Firestone. We have with us today, uh, another Californian uh, who's been represented in various anthologies uh, in literary publications. So uh, Diana, uh, or Diana, I should say the English pronunciation. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell us about yourself, your connection to the Portuguese community and, and share some work with us today. So it appears that you're muted. we're not hearing you, although it doesn't look like you're muted. Okay. Did we just lose Diana? It looks like we lost her momentarily. I think she's probably switching or something. Just to let you all know that we had uh, some issues with the codes that uh, for the first time that uh, 
uh, things at the university change, as all of you know, who've worked in the academia and they fail to tell every single person. Um, and so, uh, but we, we were able to, we have a lot more folks actually following and commenting some very nice comments on Facebook. So I invite you to look at those and I'll actually get a compilation of those and send it to you as well. Uh, lots and lots of comments uh, going on Facebook. We have it in our Gahu page, our uh, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute page, and uh, and about forty two groups that we uh, that we hook up with. Uh, and so there's lots of different comments, but I'll try to gather all those as uh, we're waiting for uh, Diana. Hopefully, she will be able to join us shortly. I don't know what uh, what happened. She was on and. Um, and all of a sudden, she it disappeared. There she is. There she is. There's. There she is. <coughs> You're on mute, Diana. Here we go. <laughs> Tech issues galore. I've been teaching for a year and a half online. You think this would work? <laughs> um, okay. So I think my I was going off on my myself there um my connection to the portuguese community is i think just like anybody else in the united states and california in particular um my parents immigrated here in the 70s uh separately at different times and met like from two different islands and met in the same town um in a very you know random way um and I grew up as typical Portuguese American as you possibly could in first generation with uh, completely full of festas on the weekends, madanzas in your garage, uh, you know, all the normal things, well, normal for me. <laughs> and then as I grew older, I realized we're totally not normal for everyone I knew. Um, so, <laughs> so I think that's where a lot of my stories sort of come from. And um, I, I've been teaching for a very long time now. Um, this is my 14th year teaching. And uh, I've sort of circled around this idea of the concept of home and always living between multiple places and, and not just physically, but also emotionally and mentally like going between multiple places because I think as a first generation um, person, you don't really belong to one place or the other. You kind of always have multiple places that you call home. So I, th I think in the roundabout way, I sort of got connected with these these sorts of communities online. And it's been kind of nice that way because of the online nature, we're able to connect with other people who are also similar to us, especially when we live in towns that don't always have as many of us around anymore. Um, so it's, it's really cool to, to share a lot of this out in, in public because um, that wasn't normal <laughs> when I was growing up. So I brought a few poems to share with you guys. Um, this one is called Pongos. The Polaroid has browned and peeled at the edges, but I can see my dad and me with shower caps on our heads, trying to protect the freshly made Pongos. Our faces were covered in flour. Our hands were still sticky with warm dough. Every year, my dad holds the pana for my mom, who's too short to knead over the counter. Eggs had been boiled, placed gently in the lumps of uncooked bread, one for each of us, like four little gifts bundles inside the heart of the bread. When I was 17, I got to hold the panda for my mom and learn the recipe, handed down from her mother's mother. That Easter, we beat eggs, sugar, and poured flour, adding warm milk slowly, and my hands grew stickier when the secret ingredient was poured in from an unmarked bottle, grandma's old whiskey. It makes the dough sweet, she says to me without a measuring cup. As the oven released fresh buns, we bundled them in warm towels, and somehow my dad always snuck a piece of bread disappearing like the sugar dissolving into the eggs. Nothing left, but buttered crumbs that he'd stuffed back beneath the cloth. Now on Easter weekend, my dad rests and we watch the air pockets in each slice of bread collapse as coffee and cream fill them up for breakfast. And remember a picture of my grandma and her bandana kneading over her tin panna, flour smeared across her forehead. I listened to stories of grandma cooking her pongos in the outdoor stove oven with only twigs to burn and fig leaves to wrap the bread while her dog would sit patiently, waiting for one to slip off the paddle and into the dirt. This one um, I wrote a while ago um, when we still had festas to go to. <laughs> um, and hopefully they, they come back uh, as cliche as they might be. They're still a very warm place for them in my heart. This one's called Fadu in a Portuguese hall in Petaluma, California. 
the doors opened to swarms of Holy Ghost members with Matanza tickets in their hands. The pig is hanging near the music stage, its rib cage held open with bamboo spears, its body decorated with red and pink flowers. The bar begins to fill up with men looking to celebrate after a day of cutting up pig meat for 300 people. Widowed sisters from San Miguel are selling filoj, $5 a bag. The rumble of voices bounces off the walls as people file into their reserved bench seating. And women with bandanas start delivering free wine, Carlo Rossi Merlot in plastic cups for everyone. Juices cost two tickets. Tickets cost $1. Tables begin to rise one by one to choose from the buffet of pork meat, yams, and American potato salad. After dinner, the folklore dancing begins. Women in short layered skirts, aprons, and braids begin circling men in short pants, ruffled uh, white shirts. Everyone claps and whistles. A 20 year old record cassette crackles while they dance. As they exit, a singer enters on stage. She's 40-ish, accent like mine. Everyone sits, eyes glued to her, as if she was a prophet. She sings of home, of farming, of love, and longing. I see an old woman close her eyes. She puts her hand over her heart. When the singer's voice pierces the silence, does she see the ocean? Does she feel the salt spray? And I know we're a little short on time, so I'll keep this, I'll do this last one here. Um, this one I wrote the past couple of days, actually, <laughs> um, unintentionally, but um, again, circling around this concept of home and uh, our, our whole area right now is, is lit on, on fire. So we're very aware of physical homes, mental homes and family. Um, so I, I wrote this one sort of with that presence in mind, but also having um, been able to go back to the Azores in a, in a couple of years. Um, and so this is sort of just a reminder of those kinds of emotions as they're coming out. It's called Thoughts on Losing a Home. What is a home if not a place in the heart? Maybe it's a place. No, it's gotta be the journey. Wait, it's, it's the family, right? My home was predestined. I was born to explore, to love, and to be lost. I never had just one home. I have causes and a baggage and homes away from home. I'm divided, waiting for a plane to take me back, a road to drive, to feel like I belong again. But deep down, I wonder if I'm just the Moshko Duvrang everywhere I go. When my trips home only last three weeks, I soak in everything. Every beer by the coast, every bowl of trumus, every tosh de mish to serve with a cafezinho, every family barbecue filled with laughter, every late night not working thinking I could do this forever. On the last night home, I pack a suitcase full of memories to hold on to until next year, of cheese and salted codfish, of trinkets to lend my growing bookcases, of linens and gifts from loved ones to remember them by. It's just stuff, right? Things are replaceable, memories linger longer, homes get sold or fall apart from people moving away, legacies forgotten. Then why is it when I close my eyes real tight, I can hear the swaying of pine trees, feel the coolness of mountain air on my skin, taste the salt spray at the Avega, see all the kitchen tables I've sat at, feel the bitterness of empty wine glasses. Thanks. That was excellent. Incredible. There's, there's so much there. I always say that, you know, the, those little treasures of the Portuguese American community are, are, are the heart of, of really what we are. And home, like that, that's, that's so Portuguese American, right? Because anyone knows, you know, when we're here, we miss it there. When we're there, we love it. We miss it here, miss our family, right? Because we're so divided. We're living on that hyphen, right? So you, you captured that so well. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Well, I believe that that is it. So we may have some questions coming in the chat. Um, what I can do is I can start it off with the question while we're seeing if any, any questions come in the chat, and then we can, we can work those in as well. So um, I'll go in the same order. I'll start back up with, uh, with Sue and then go to Nancy, Ann, and then Diana again. Um, but really, really what I'd like to know is how, how, the, how your Portuguese ethnicity influences your work. So um, are there any certain aspects, for example, of, of like the Portuguese culture uh, that you gravitate towards or maybe that you feel particularly inspired by? 
uh, in your in your in your writing. For example, for me, like it's those small, those little rituals, those little treasures that hide in plain sight, right? The 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 plastic cups with the with the one dollar, right? Like, that's incredible, right? The, things like that. So, is there anything like that? I, I'd love if you could talk about that. You know, I really didn't grow up so involved in the Portuguese community, except for my my grandparents. You know, and and that was, you know, they they turned to Portuguese when they didn't want us to understand. You know, they spoke bad English, but they spoke English most of the time, so it didn't. So it's more one of the working class roots that affects my life. In, and, you know, I think a lot of my childhood, I didn't do things other kids did. I was more sheltered. I wasn't allowed to go do a lot of things that everybody else was doing. And I that may be part of that, that background that, you know, you're going to go off by yourself to, no, you're not, you know. And I was not encouraged to go to college. Um, that was my own idea. And, uh, you know, so I think it's that sort of thing. It's just, it was different. It wasn't all because of being Portuguese, but it was all mixed together. Yeah, that's an incredible point. You know, it's not all just the physical things like the wine and the festas and the malasadas and, and all of those amazing things. It's it's the values and it's the the cultural aspects as well, right? That you know, you know, growing up in a in a Portuguese American community, uh, you tend to we see more more traditional communities, and that there's there's mm -hmm. good aspects and there's bad aspects of that. But that's all that's all us, and that all influences who we are, and that shapes who we are, and it shapes right. our right too, right. right? So that's an incredible point to make. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Logan, yes. can I interrupt for just uh, just before you go to Nancy? I just want to thank Miguel Vaz from Flat, who's been accompanying us since uh, uh, five, which is uh, since one o'clock in the morning, and uh, it's uh, after two in the morning in Lisbon, and he's still with us, but he might have to fall asleep uh, soon. <laughs> we hope he does because he has to go to work tomorrow. But tomorrow. I just wanted to, I just want to acknowledge uh, Miguel and thank him so much for his commitment to everything that's Portuguese. He's he's. Uh, is a strong bond between uh, Flad and the, and the Portuguese community in the United States. So sorry to, to interrupt. No, that's, I echo that 100%. Well, thank you. So Nancy, we'll go to you. Uh, okay. Um, I don't really know how to answer your question. Um, I probably, because of when my, my father um, came to America in 1920 and my maternal grandparents in 1901 and 1903. Um, so uh, I'm an American. I'm, I'm a New Englander. That's it's all part of it. But the one thing when I when I went to uh, when I entered an MFA program, I had been out of school for 14 years. So I was an older grad school student. So it was like already late in life to be thinking about my childhood. But when you're in an MFA program, you read a lot of things that people are writing about their childhood. And I thought, you know, hey, in my childhood, a different language, my childhood was in a different language because I did grow up in a bilingual home. And um, I mean, I was, take, I was taking a, a Portuguese course. I didn't, it wasn't required of me, but I don't know how, I haven't figured out how to handle the the language thing, but you know, there's, um, there's that that's different from from when I read a lot of writing by writers and oh, but even other Portuguese American writers have completely different backgrounds and um, I read a lot of poems and stories centered around around fascists. I never I think once once I went to the the Madeiran feast once and I ate some favas and and I mean, like I was there for maybe half an hour and that's it. We lived in New Bedford and in Dartmouth, but we never went to the Fashta. Um, and we didn't go to church every Sunday either. So I, you know, I just don't have that church relationship. So I think naturally it affects me, but it's not, it's not like a, um, um, it's not like a genre that I have to write in. It, it's it's just part of who I am. Um, and I just do the best I can with it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, this might be a little radical to say, but I don't think that you have to go to the Fashta do Espírito Santo to be Portuguese. That ah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I mean, even, you know, 
knowing a little bit about you, Nancy, I know that you have your interest in your, your genealogical roots, right? So I, right. I feel like that may also play a root, right? You know, listening to the, uh, play a, a rule, a role, pardon. Uh, the way, you know, listening to the way that you talk about Santa Maria and, you know, exploring your heritage, I think that, that you know, it's, it's present. So you're just, you're living proof that, you know, it's, it's there. It's always yeah. there with us, you know. But I would, I would be doing that. If my ancestors were a Lithuanian, I'd be going to Lithuania. So, I, yeah. you know, it's not, it's not because I'm Portuguese. It's, it's, I don't know, because I'm curious. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Thanks so much, Nancy. Um, Anne-Marie, we'll, we'll go to you. I didn't have that much contact with the you ancestors know, and that sort of expression of being Portuguese when I was a child. Um, it was more centered on the experiences of, you know, actual relatives, and we were kind of like this little, we're kind of like our own little island of our customs and our history that was different from most people. Um, but I was always really interested in that. I mean, my mom would tell stories that she lived in a multi-generational house by the beach, and that was way more fascinating than anything that was going on in the island, right? In the 80s, in my, you know, life. And those things inspired me really young, and I mean, I guess I'm still doing that school report about my mom, you know, in a way. Um, and I just keep finding out more and more about people that were more and more interesting and beyond the veneer of what it's supposed to be. And I've just kept going with that. Um, right now I'm trying to research my grandfather's grandfather that was never talked about. And he, you know, I haven't been able to figure out exactly who his mother is. And he would go from um, Praia to New York to ship things and we don't know why. And, that's, it's, it's yeah, absolutely. That curiosity is something that, you know, uh, a lot of us can share. So, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll go to Diana. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of that curiosity concept because I think that's, I, I don't know if it's just second nature or if it's just part of our exploring culture, but in, in general, that's definitely part of it um, for me. There's I didn't have a choice of whether or not I wanted to go back to Piku or some or St. George, mostly Piku when I was a kid. It was uh, definitely, um, it was like, this is our family vacation. All the other kids I knew were going to Disneyland and, you know, doing uh, the, 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 the quintessential American trips and they were planning like to go to Europe, like it was a thing. And then there's my family with, you know, multiple suitcases, taking gifts back and bringing back wheels of cheese. Um, and so it was my, um, it, it was very much a part of my active life, like childhood. Um, and even as an adult and like as a kid, I think I was more begrudging about going back because I always missed things like 4th of July. I never got to experience fireworks in, in America. Um, not often. It wasn't until I was older and we weren't going back every year that I, I was like, oh, this is what kids do here. This is great. This is what summer's like. Um, and, and then as an adult, you know, you realize that those, those trips were really treasures. Like they were gifts. Like I'm super grateful that my parents were able to send us back as often as they could. Even if they couldn't go with us, they would send us back. Like that's how <laughs> dedicated they were to us learning the language and the food. And, um, it's inescapable, I think in my life. So it's definitely a huge part of my identity to, um, to be a part of that community and language itself was something that I explored as a kid often. Like I, I watched people talk. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but um, I observed how people interacted and, um, and it, it gave me a perspective on other cultures too, not just Portuguese and Portuguese American, because you, you realize that your little community is sort of a, a slice of every other little community that's out there as well that's also experiencing similar things in America. So I think that's where like a lot of me and my friends were able to bond as kids, even though we weren't the same background necessarily. We were able to connect on those those levels, um, especially since most of our parents didn't speak English. So, <laughs> you know, my mom spoke English. Um, she came here when she was 12, but my my dad came when he was uh, 17 and it took him a long time to learn. Um, there weren't exactly a lot of translators for Portuguese to English. So <laughs> we did it when we were kids a lot. And um, so it was just part of 
every day, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. I can remember reading my grandfather's mail to him. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Did there happen to be any questions here coming in the chat, Dinesh? I'm not sure that I'm... No, I don't see any. And uh, all of the messages also on Facebook Live were basically just uh, compliments uh, on everybody's reading. So no, no other questions that I know of. All righty then. I believe that brings us... I, I know, I remember, Dinesh, did you say that you wanted to make uh, any announcement at the end? Uh, I do, and I wanted to, um, if I make, make a brief comment as well, uh, which is, first of all, thank you all, and thank you, Logan, for your uh, e excellent work uh, moderating the panel, uh, and thank you all for participating, and those of you uh, also joining us, whether you're on Facebook Live or here. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the, 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 your perspectives are all very interesting to me, because, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we have at Fresno State, as uh, I think most of you know, uh, since we began the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute a couple of years ago is the, the collection of the Portuguese oral histories. It's kind of our basis for everything that we're doing uh, because we should have done these things, you know, uh, maybe 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. We lost a lot of treasure stories that are gone, you know. Um, the, the, those pioneers who came in the late, 1900, late 1800s and beginning of the, of the 20th century, we lost those stories, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, and, and we lost uh, 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 a very important part of our history in California anyway, between those, uh, between the, the, that time, that uh, was a time that my grandfather also immigrated and went back as I'm an immigrant. I came at nine, pretty much at almost the same age as uh, Diana's mom. Um, and that is that, um, so my grandfather went back, but those who stayed, of course, had all these stories that you know, now, you know, Sue's grandparents and everything else. And we, we lost a lot of those stories. Um, and hopefully some of you who are creators, uh, whether it be in poetry or, or, or fiction, or some of you nonfiction as well, are recreating those stories. And thanks to you for recreating those stories or else we would have lose them, we'd lose them completely. But part of our oral history, um, I, I tell the folks who helped me with this, the Portuguese American presence in California, and I would think the same thing in the East Coast, um, is not just the immigrant story. It's not me or Diana's parents. Um, it is you. It's Diana who was born here. It's those who are of second, third, and fourth generation. Imagine if, this, if the Portuguese American experience in the United States was just the immigrant. We haven't had any significant immigration in the last 40 years. So basically, you know, our story would be ending. But our story is not ending. It is, you know, of second, third, fourth, and fifth generation. And, uh, and I agreed with what Nancy said that, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, Lithuanian or Polish, you're going to do the same, you know, if, because of you being curious and because of, and because ancestry is different in America today than what it was a few years ago. Uh, you know, I'm of the generation that we wanted to become very American, maybe because of what Diana mentioned. I had to translate from my parents for everything, everything we went. I mean, I had to go to the bank. I had to go to the insurance company. I had to go to everything. My dad did not go anywhere without me going a, a, along to translate. And that you know, has a, a, its romantic aspect when you're 62, like I am now, but it didn't, wasn't very romantic <laughs> when I was 11 and 12. I hated doing it. And so when I, when I entered into high school and what I wanted to do, the last thing I wanted to do was be Portuguese. Uh, I wanted to be American, you know, I wanted to fit in, you know, and then, of course, as you go on, then you start, you know, because people looked at ancestry a bit different of, in the uh, uh, early 1970s than they look at it today, you know. And so, uh, but some of these things that I'm reading, you know, and all of you, whether you go to a festa once uh, every blue moon, like Nancy said, I don't go to festas myself as much as maybe I should, but um they were part of my of my of my upbringing because you know, whether I liked it or not, as Diana said, my parents made me go to a festa, uh, and so. But uh, the the idea that uh, there is there is uh, just like the Portuguese American story continues beyond the immigrant generation or the first generation born in America, so does the Portuguese American poetry. So does the Portuguese American. Um, fiction. Um, I think it continues in second and third and fourth generation. And I, you know, 
uh, I've read, you know, I've been fortunate to read a lot of what Nancy has written. I think she's, uh, like all of you, a very fine poet. And um, and there's some things that you may read and you, you may say, well, you know, uh, uh, somebody, somebody else may read it, have a different reading on it. But when I read a lot of uh, your poetry, um, even if there's, even if it's about a, a social justice issue that you're concerned with or an environmental issue you're concerned with, um, I see a lot of Portuguese in it. And maybe, maybe because I'm biased, you know, but I do see a lot of Portuguese in it. It's not like you're going to discover that. It's not like you're doing it on purpose, maybe, but it's be because of that ancestral background and that, sh that that is within you. So, you know, whether we talk about the thing, the the, the issue of the uh, of something that is very Portuguese, as Diana mentioned, you know, some of those lovely things that Logan said, and it's true. You know, sometimes those hidden things that we see but we don't see, um, or whether we're talking about an issue that is something uh, of uh, mainstream America. I see a lot of things of the Portuguese culture in uh, in all that uh, all of you read today and uh, and and have written uh, have written and I have read in the past as well and so um, I just want to again thank you all and uh, please continue uh, this all of these readings made me think of uh, the conversation I had with Luis um, uh, and uh, and uh, Carlo a, a few months ago um, about it, it is time that maybe in the Portuguese American community we need another um, anthology, uh, because it is great to have, of course, all of you published individually, and I hope all of you continue to do that, and if we can help, we'd be more than happy to, but it, it would also be wonderful with, all, with everything that's being done and created in the last few years, in the last two or three years, to come up with an anthology that includes the Portuguese work uh, here. I, I'm a, a firm believer, I'm working on a, just a I'm working on a project called Into the Azorian Sea, which is basically about, um, uh, which is translating Azorian poets from Portuguese to English. But my goal is to include Portuguese American poets who write in English and translate their work, some your work to Portuguese, because the Portuguese American, the, the, the Azorian, this is one is very tailored to the Azores, but the Azorian experience and you can say the same thing about the Portuguese experience. It's not just basically in the nine islands of the Azores or in that rectangle at the end of the small rectangle at the end of, uh, of Europe. Um, Portugal is more Portugal with its diaspora, whether it be first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, um, uh, if, you, if you are only a quarter Portuguese, but you identify that's what's important. Um, and so I believe that uh, it would be wonderful and I hope to we can maybe uh, work with a couple of people and maybe get a, a few of you on board as well. And uh, hopefully in the near future, we could have an anthology with some of your uh, new uh, work from the last couple of years, because it is it is it is important in two aspects. It's important, first of all, for more people to know your work. And second of all, um, it is important as we, and especially here from a California aspect, as we start to teach ethnic studies, it's a requirement, as many of you know, uh, it's going to be in our, in our uh, colleges and the CSU system and the, and the community colleges and the UCs, and it's going to be a requirement in high school sooner or later, um, that when we talk about ethnic groups in America, that there's a space for the Portuguese American experience. Um, and and uh, that can only be done if we have anthologies, if we have works that can be used in the classroom. So hopefully we can all embark on that. Logan, or anybody else, sorry. Yeah, Sue, actually, I believe. I just wanted to make a, a point. You know, you were talking about the lost stories. My mother's grandparents were, were illiterate, so they did not keep a written record of anything because they couldn't read or write in Portuguese or English. And I think that's a big loss. I mean, other cultures in the United States, you know, we can find diaries and books and letters and things, but we don't have any written record. So it's up to us to find what we can now. But yeah, there is that lost period that it's a shame. But you did a fine job with stories grandma never told. Yeah, and thank God, because many of those women have passed on now. <laughs> I, I, yep, go ahead, Diana. Absolutely. Oh, to that point, Sue, it made me think of something that uh, my mom and I are working on 
as like have been working on as like a pet project is just writing down recipes um, from my great, great, you know, everybody basically. Um, and it's for that reason, because so many people were illiterate, they were all farmers in our communities, at least on the islands, most of them were farmers. And if you went to university, it was a big deal. Um, so the oral tradition is a, is a big part of it, whether it's English or Portuguese, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's, it's about preserving the, the stories. And I hadn't, we hadn't realized how important that was until, you know, there, we don't have the stories written down. Like we don't have these recipes aren't written down. So my, my mom and I are, you know, we'll, we'll cook a recipe or two and then write the recipe down because we, we learned everything like language. I, I didn't learn how to read Portuguese as a, as a kid because my dad didn't read. Um, but I spoke it because it was spoken. And so a lot of, like, I think a lot of our, our culture is preserved with oral tradition. And it, and that's what was lost when people immigrated here after the earthquake and, you know, the fifties and uh, from, from Fayal and whatnot. And for, for whatever other reasons as well, stories weren't part of the priority. It was survival and, and exploration. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those stories weren't written down for the, for a lot of those reasons. So it's really cool to see a lot of us putting energy and effort towards those, getting those stories documented. Those recipes are gold because <laughs> I can't tell you how many people in my family, my, my, you know, my team Maria, for example, you know, makes a, makes a great ahoj dos or she'll ask me, I'll say, Oh, can you show me, can you give me the recipe for this? Oh, I don't know. Just come over. I'll show you how to make it. Right. So it's like, yeah. that's such a, a Portuguese thing. So that's, that. that's incredible. You don't realize how significant some of those are because there's always a Tia Maria that brings one to the party and you don't realize that next time you're the Tia Maria that needs to bring it to the party and you don't have it. So yeah, family tradition and culture is definitely like, it's all oil. I have a question for um, Diana. What was that um, that bread that was was made for Easter? I'm not familiar with the name. It's it just pombos or filoge, depends on um, which island you're from. Yeah, oh, filoge, I've heard of. What was the other word? Pombos, it's sweet bread. Um, and it's oh, sweet bread, masa. Yeah, yeah. That's what we call it, masa. If you're okay. from Miguel, you call it masa. If you're from Piku, it's called pongos. <laughs> I've never heard that word before. Simple. Um, but yeah, the eggs go inside. You make a little basket out of it. Oh, we, yeah, we just call it masa with eggs in it. That's only made at Easter. <laughs> well, I was the one with the eggs. And there's like, a, let's, I learned the whole process from my, I mean, thank God for my mom, because like she teaches me all this stuff when I was a, you know, punk ass teenager and didn't want to learn any of it. Um, a lot like Dinesh, like I didn't want to learn any of this. And then as I got older, I realized how precious some of these things really are because they're a part yeah. of my, my, they're a part of who I am. And I didn't realize it until I was older. So yeah. Yeah. And, and I live in a city where I can't buy that stuff in a store or in a bakery yeah. there. So when I visit the New Bedford area, it's like getting my sweet bread on, on the way home and, and stopping at Portugalia Marketplace and buying a whole lot of salt cod. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just like, I, I just long for the food that I grew up eating. Mm -hmm. That's so good. Yeah, my suitcases smell horrible when we travel. <laughs> but but I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean i echo everything you're saying so I, there's there's no better feeling than being able to walk through a supermarket by the way in easter and see you know you have the full out of the pashkla with the you know the sweetbread with the egg in it and it, it just makes you feel really really at home and, and very portuguese american but um i guess uh just to add a, a small comment to to what you're saying i i totally agree with the fact that you know by documenting these things we're, we're immortalizing our roots and, and our, our, our grandparents, for example, you know, the first poem I ever published not too long ago was, uh, was about my grandfather, right? And it was actually thanks to Dinesh, right? So um, it was actually part of that initiative, uh, you know, remembering our, our Vosh, right? So, you know, the whole reason that I ever got into Portuguese in general or, or writing about the Luso diasporic experience was because of my grandfather and because of my my heritage and my relationship with him. I wanted to take that and I wanted to immortalize that. And I knew that there were others like me and I wanted to connect with them, right? So so I think that this work is is absolutely essential for our community. Um, so everything that we're talking about here, um, I echo fervently. 
Well, I think we come to an end. Thank you all so much. Thank you again uh, to Logan for moderating it. Thanks to Anna Marie. Thanks to Diana and uh, Nancy and Sue. Uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, live uh, on the social media platforms. Uh, apologize for some of the uh, technical issues there at the beginning, uh, but we have everybody on. And so uh, appreciate all of your work. Thanks. Please continue writing poetry, or prose, fiction, nonfiction. Please write these stories. Please continue writing those recipes, uh, uh, Diana. Uh, you, you mentioned exactly, and, and, and uh, Nancy echoed, you know, the, the Portuguese teachers, as, uh, as uh, Logan knows, the Portuguese teacher's nightmare, which is we have, you know, like five words for the same thing. And so, you know, why can it just be called Massa Suvada? Why is it also called Pão Dulce and Fular and all this kind of stuff? And so um, uh, that is a Portuguese teacher's nightmare when we're teaching a language like Portuguese it's so rich but and it has all of these different regionalisms you know I mean why do they call it it was one of my first questions when I started teaching Portuguese many years ago a young lady asked me senor why do they call it filoche in one island and malasadas in another island isn't it just a filoche and I said well it's a little bit more complicated than that but it is you know we do the Portuguese language does have that rich aspect to it uh, uh, and uh, and part of being you know uh, mainland Portugal you know uh, also and then the islands and each island has its own tradition uh, but thank you all for uh, for immortalizing as uh, uh, quoting Logan these stories thank you for your uh, writing please continue to do so and uh, let's continue uh, the conversation million thanks to all of you and thanks to all of you for following us appreciate it thank you Denise. Yeah. thank you thank, thank you good night everyone good night